So today we're standing outside the world headquarters of the Brewing Network. Uh, before we go in and meet Justin, the brains behind the operation, I wanted to give you my perspective of the Brewing Network and the studios as I've seen it grow over the years. Justin started the company, I believe six years ago, we'll find that out soon. Um, like most of us as small business owners, with a dream and very little money. So we'll see the evolution of his studio growth, the evolution of the sound quality, and just get to know how he did it. But before we go in, I wanted to explain the house a little bit. Uh, Justin's a great guy. He takes people in like brothers. Um, and so often Justin has roommates, and many times those people are from out of the country. Uh, France, Italy, you name it, he's had someone living here from one of those countries and then they have friends living there. So oftentimes you'll walk in, it's like a fraternity. People are sleeping on the couch, there's beer cans on the floor, it's very fun, very good atmosphere. Oh yeah, and be careful of the dogs. So Justin, we yeah. got a little role reversal today. Yeah. One of your most awkward guests in front of a camera or in front of a uh, microphone is me. <laughs> you usually make me have at least one beer, sometimes more, just to do a segment. Right. Happens to be the one interviewing you today, the most comfortable man in front of a camera. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I am really, in I think the role reversal is going to be fun. I I'm going to enjoy seeing you have to ask the questions and squirm a little bit. It, it, you're not as bad as you think on the camera, but it is an odd role reversal. I usually, it's not just a beer, it's a beer and a roofie to get you just <laughs> where we need you. That's what that is. To do the show. That's why you start giving away prizes on the show. Uh, but this is definitely an odd reversal. Well, you might want to watch the whole video and find the Easter egg in there because I tend to like to give stuff away. Okay, good. Also, we chose the nicest day of the year. <laughs> it never rains in Northern California, and yet today we have a lovely one out here. It has been our driest season in years, and uh, no, not when you guys show up. Yep. Pouring with rain. <laughs> the sky weeps. Yes, for the BN. Perfect. <laughs> We're here with Justin Crosley and the Brewing Network's personal brewery. Yeah. Justin, do you want to give us a quick tour of your brewery? Yeah, definitely. This is my uh, B3. I always forget the number because I'm terrible. But mine's a 1500, right? 1550. It's a 1550. Yes. It's even higher than a 1500. And uh, God, I've had this now for, I think, close to four years. And um, I would have to say that it has changed my brewing entirely. My beers have gone from a one to a two and a half Sweet. since upgrading to this. Good to, good to know, audience. <laughs> you too yes. can brew that much better One beer. and a half points, guaranteed. <laughs> you should put that in the, in the, uh, in the brochure. Sweet. But it was, um, honestly, it was Jamil Zanishev's brewery before it was mine, and uh, he was ready to upgrade. And I had pretty much been, um, in a subtle way, I can do this subtle guilt thing that I've been doing to Chris Graham and Olin for years, like, man, Everybody sure does have those brew sculptures in their house, and they sure do seem cool. And I talk about them the most to, to people on my radio shows. And finally, they caved, and Jamil was ready to upgrade. They, they took this back to more beer. You guys, you could probably say more than me, but completely reconditioned it for me and, and repainted everything, put my brewing network label on it. Um, some of the electronics were ready to be updated. There was nothing wrong with them, but you guys wanted to give me like the new 1550. So you updated some of that stuff and uh, brought it to my place. And then Chris actually gave me the, the first kind of official tour on a brew day. You came and brewed with me and Chad. Yep. Um, that, a lot of fun. You guys were, were pretty interesting to brew with. <laughs> so technically between Jamil, it went to my house okay. and became an R&D monster. Got it. We drilled a lot of holes. We tried to make things work. Uh, we tried new things. And then I'm like, oh, I'll just give this little redheaded stepchild to Justin because why Love not? <laughs> I am like the hand me down king anyway. And listen, who's complaining about getting handed down a 1550, right? Br Bruce Sculpture hand me downs are not so bad. <laughs> so, what do you use the system for? Well, I'll be honest with you, right now it's not getting a whole lot of use uh, through the winter, but. For one, uh, you know, we've had roommates in and out of this house for a long time. Uh, Chad lived here for a long time and also worked with us on the Brewing Network. He brewed on this thing twice a week for like a year and a half. Holy cow, for yeah. what? Uh, just to get, he wants to be a pro brewer 
In fact, now he's working for a brew pub that uh, does some contract brewing and, and will eventually build their own brewery. And he just knew that the only way to do that is to brew, brew, brew. And I think he also felt that because of the automation and different things on the 1550, that it was closer to a pro experience than like my old igloo system, which I loved, to be honest with you. My igloo mash tun would lose maybe two degrees over a one hour mash. I love that thing. Those uh, are pretty sweet. And, and I'll just throw a quick plug in. You'll see that this month, that's what we're featuring oh, due oh, cool. to being one of Justin's favorite brewing tools. A listener bought me my first igloo Oh, kit. so this is how you work. Dude, Someone I else get, buys your brew system. As you, as you start to see the, how the brewing network works, you realize there's no cash involved on my <laughs> part. It doesn't exist. So people just, they give. So if the IRS <laughs> is watching. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but I love my igloo system. Um, but this one, having more automation, I think made Chad feel a little closer to a professional brewery. So he brewed on it, like I said, twice a week for like a year and a half, producing some great beer. I brew on it a couple times a year. Uh, the last thing I brewed was a Sriracha Ace Pale Ale. Oh, nice. Yeah, I did this trip through the Pacific Northwest and uh, about five breweries were producing this Sriracha Ace, Ace Pale Ale, and I wanted to know why everyone was so interested in this hop. So I came back, um, went over to Heretic, because he had a bunch of it, of the hops, got myself some, and probably brewed the best beer I've ever brewed. It was a, it was a good beer. Nice. And I'm, a, I'm my own toughest critic, and I really like that beer. Um, there wasn't much to it. I took Jamil's uh, Pale Ale recipe from Brewing Classic Styles and really just substituted the hops, the hops to be all Sriracha Ace. Um, so I did that the second, uh, right after, two days later, I brewed a hoppy red ale that I totally uh, screwed up. I thought you were going to say killed it. No, I totally screwed that up. So that's why, uh, but it was not the fault of the system. Uh, I would say the thing I like most about it um, and, and how it's kind of changed my brewing is, is the reason you said you guys have created it. And that's that you're the only person on earth lazier than I am, Chris Graham. And it does have some of those features, like uh, the automation and moving liquid around really kind of helps that. Um, and being able to like set the temperatures and then sit back and have a beer and, and maybe smoke a hookah, I mean, whatever. Whatever happens at the BN happens <laughs> yeah, at the BN. Exactly. So those are the things that I think I, I really like about it. Not to mention the volume increase from my last uh, system. You went from five to ten. Yeah, cool. exactly. And so being able to in this house, it was ridiculous <laughs> to brew five gallons at a time. That's why well, no one's ever here. Worth of, uh, yeah, <laughs> and so uh, you know all of those things. Of course, I've got a tippy dump on the top, um, which aids in my laziness. You just dump. You put a garbage can underneath, pull it down, empty the mash tun. Um, so. I just think it made brewing a little more enjoyable for me, uh, because for my lazy side, it just it's just a little easier. Sweet, and that's that's why we make them. Is it's, I, I use the word lazy. I like to use <laughs> controlled and efficient. Ah, there you go. Yes, it's yeah, much easier that way. That's if you want to tell yes, yourself that, yes. Graham. That's I feel fine. better about myself. For me, you know, honestly, was my kettles being where they're supposed to be when I woke up in the morning. Yeah, I used to have true. a system that I used to have to assemble every time I wanted to a brew. I put it in storage closets. I hated that. Yeah. Trying to remember, oh, where's my spar jar? Where's my this? Where's my that? And having it right there just helps. No, you're right about that. Because it can be kind of daunting, especially when you look at how much time you have to brew on the Saturday. If you have to add construction yeah. of your brewery to that time. So yeah, we just kind of take this. Uh, we have an, a cover here. We drag it out so that you know it's a little more under the, it can ventilate out. But we just drag it over here, hook up some hoses, and it's, it's pretty much ready to go. Um, so I love it. I, I mean, I also like having our name on it. And to, that, that, that feels good. Well, so Chad's moving out right now. And he kind of goes, so what are you going to do with the, with the brewery? <laughs> and I was like, well, whose name is on the brewery? It's staying right where it is. Possession is nine-tenths of the law, my friend. <laughs> yeah, it's staying right there. Uh, but of course, he can come brew on it anytime he wants. Continuing on the tour of the Brewing Network, I wanted the audience to be able to see the original studio. And I know <laughs> it's no longer the studio, so a little bit of imagination has to be in play here. Yeah. But in the house, grand scheme of things, what are we in? All right, so you are in what we uh, commonly refer to as Studio A. Studio A. <laughs> Alpha. Yeah, Studio A. And uh, we're kind of standing in the remnants of the old broadcast desk that a friend and I built. Um, and you can, I don't know how much you can see, but there's some felt 
and carpeted ceiling and different things that help make the room sound dead. So really, this is, this is really where the BN started. Um, I did came the, from did a... Did Bed Bath & Beyond have a sale on, <laughs> on you know, well, small area rugs? As you'll start to learn, and we talked about it even at the brew uh, system, almost everything I get for free. Uh, so, and it's sort of the nature of how we started this company. I was a broadcast, I went to school for broadcasting and really an audio geek. And I wanted to start this company and had to do it on a, on a budget. I mean, I had nothing. I, you I, didn't I, have unlimited <laughs> tech funding? You know, I was, uh, I was 25 grand in debt to the university. I remember you then. Yeah. Um, I was a bartender at a golf course uh, uh, grill and, uh, and at a, a brew pub at the time, actually. I had a couple of jobs. And so, you know, I had enough money to pay the rent, but I wanted to start this company. So, you know, you do what you do. You get a credit card. <laughs> And um, and you get as much as you can for free. So I went like to a carpet shop, and you know when they get new carpet in every year, they throw out their old swatches. So I grabbed all these uh -huh. old carpet swatches, knowing that in a radio station you don't need it to be soundproof. You need it to be sound dead, and it just helps reduce the echo. Uh, a broadcast desk, uh, which which is really just uh, it's a normal desk with spaces to put your audio equipment into and enough room to have guests. Well, to have these built, they're they're five thousand, ten thousand dollars. So I had a buddy come in and help me. I mean, we spent two months building this stupid thing, um, and anyhow, took just a lot of a, a hodgepodge of equipment and built a studio in here that was the original Brewing Network. Um, now it's our shipping desk, uh, all kind of taken apart because we sell a lot of our, our T-shirts and hats and things like that to fund uh, the radio station. So. As, much, as dingy as it is, and, and as much as I love our new studio, which you'll see, I have a lot of fond memories here. I mean, I think that brewers and guests like you would show up at my house and kind of go, God, what are we getting ourselves <laughs> into? And even maybe walk into my garage slash studio and go, God, really, what are we getting ourselves into? But I think that within a few minutes of doing the show, guests would get it like, oh, th he's really tried to build a, a radio station here. And, and that's what we did. We just did it on a budget, you know. And, and I, you did a great job because I remember in the very beginning and you guys were like, hey, Graham, come on. And I used to give away stuff. And we'll, we'll try not to do too much of that. But uh, <laughs> I had the same thing. You go into this house. You don't even knock because if you knock, nobody's going to answer it. Right. And you have to just come in. You just got to figure it out. There's an animal or two that's going to greet you. Yes. You got to be calm. It's a pit bull. Be calm. Be calm. <laughs> Biscuit was the nicest dog around. Yeah. And, and you just didn't know. But once you got in this room, once they said the mic was on, it changed from the most casual, fun atmosphere to the most professional, fun atmosphere. I'm glad, I mean, that was always the point, that, uh, you know, you have to make people feel comfortable. I don't think that before we started, there was a whole lot of air time for brewers and guys like you. Not many people were sticking a no, microphone in no. your face to ask your life story. And we changed that for, for brewers. We wanted to know, we're beer geeks, we want to know all about you. This is your time. And so, you first have to make them feel comfortable. And that was, we would hang out and have some fun. But... I take radio very seriously. So you're right. As soon as those microphones went on, I mean, I have a plan. Because um, you loved it when I did this a lot. Oh, God, the slamming of glasses on this desk. We fixed it in our new studio. But it would, uh, it would pong through the metal pole holding the microphone. And Chris Graham used to watch my face. Yeah. Like, just... I'd be like, oh, I did something bad. <laughs> yeah, nails on a yeah. chalkboard for me. But it really started here, and now we've outgrown it because we needed a, a space to uh, put all our T-shirts and hats, and we needed a better studio. Um, so, and it's been awesome to see you grow. We'll get to the new studio. We'll get to your fancy real stuff. But I <laughs> love living back in the past when Justin and John Plisse came to us and said we want to make a show about brewing. Yeah, I kind of giggled on the inside and said, <laughs> "Yeah, these guys are going to be out of business in, in four months." Watch this. And yeah. You're my favorite mistake. <laughs> you <laughs> right. proved us wrong, and uh, you built quite an empire. Well, thanks. So let's go check out the rest of All it. All right, cheers. <laughs>
We're here in the green room slash yeah. waiting room for the Burring Network. Yeah. One of my favorite rooms. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about this room. Well, the importance of a green room, especially with a show like ours, is we do like a three and a half, four hour radio show. It's stupid, the, the length of our show. Uh, so during the, the breaks, and also when it's not your segment, if you're a guest, and sometimes if you're a lazy co-host, you come hang out in here, which is basically the kegerator room. Uh, we set up some couches, and we actually stream the show to our, our big screen right there so that people can watch what's going on um, and really entertain themselves. So with a long show like that, you just you kind of need a comfortable area for people to come hang out. Come hang out. Tell us about the beer you usually put on tap. How yeah. do you get it? Well, it used to be, you know, I told you when Chad was brewing like uh, twice a week, it, all four of these taps were full all the time. By the way, another freebie, this kegerator used to be at a strip club. And the owner of the strip club was like, called us. I don't know why. <laughs> we were on his list. <laughs> and uh, he said, hey, I got a... How do you get on that list? <laughs> you got a kegerator. And anyway, so we got this for free. It's called the Stripperator. Um, now that Chad's gone, we don't have these taps full all the time. I've recently resorted to buying kegs what? every now and then. What about, what about the people on the show? Well, that's the funny part about the history of the show. So we're going into our... We're on our seventh year. We've gone through almost every brewery in Northern California, some of them three times. That makes sense. So it used to be that guests showed up with beer and we put it on tap or bottles of beer. We didn't care. Well, now we're doing so many phone interviews with people around the country and, and sometimes around the world that very few of them ship beer. If you're a potential guest, I want to say right now, if you want to be considered for this program, you better consider shipping us some beer. Because, and partly I'm, I'm being serious, in part I'm joking, but if you think about it, we do interviews about these breweries, and half the time we're doing it blind. I don't know how to talk about their pale ale if their pale ale isn't in front of me. Mm -hmm. The other, of course, the downside to that is I have to go out and pay for beer for all of our guests and our co-hosts, and it... What, they want beer? <laughs> actually, most of our co-hosts, you know, that's part of the whole on the cheap theme. So many people have volunteered their sure. time for the Brewing Network. This is not a Justin project. This is a community project. And, and without them, I couldn't have done it. And so at the very least I can do is keep something on tap for them in the green room. Good call. <laughs> and bottles of beer. So we try to keep a few things going. You know, I got some Drake's 1500. There's some guest beer from last week. Um, Flying Dog sent us beer. Good, Good example guest. of a guest. Send beer before you do the interview. And uh, anyway, we try to keep it as stocked as possible. So the show, the, the original show, Yeah. we'll get into the shows a little bit later, but the original show was on Sunday nights. Right. Why Sunday nights, <laughs> first off? So this was a tough decision for me. Uh, here we are creating a show that's never been out there before uh, in the sense that it's a live beer radio show where we need participation from the audience. I wanted callers and, and you name it. It's it, like real radio. So I'm trying to think of the demographic of homebrewers. Well, a lot of these guys are family guys, or at the very least, they have a real job. Uh, not like you and me, Chris Graham. They got real <laughs> jobs. What? Uh, so. I just tried to think, well, well, when do they have time? So the first thought is weekends. But a lot of family time is spent on weekends. So I thought, okay, 5 o'clock on a Sunday night. On the West Coast, you can skip away from the family for a little while because you spent all day Saturday and all day Sunday with the family. Go in the garage, listen to the show. On the East Coast, it's late enough that the kids are probably in bed already. It's 8 o'clock when you start. So it was really just this balance of when can the most of our demographic listen live. That was my sole decision. Got it. I kind of regret it now because I'd rather have my weekends off. <laughs> but what are you going to do? Well, with that said, how many guests have slept or co-hosts or hosts <laughs> right. have slept on these said couches right here <laughs> because they drank a little too much on a Sunday night? You know, the first few years of the show, it was so fun and so novel, not only for us, but for everybody who came on. Oh, these couches were full all the time. Guests, hosts, friends wanting to just see it or get free beer. In the last year or two, it's, it's tapered off a little bit. Uh, my girlfriend lives here now. Why do we have to have all these people at the house all the time? Uh, so things like that started to happen. Um, and like I said, most of our guests aren't from California anymore. But I will say, um, the cab companies love us yeah. because uh, <laughs> we, we, we pay for a lot of cab rides. And uh, we have plenty of a place for people to sleep and have a good time. The show should feel like a party, both on air and we want our guests to have fun. Otherwise, why would they come spend the time with us? Exactly. I mean, 
I have to admit, the reasons I like to keep coming over here is it is a party. It's yeah. a ton of fun. Yeah. And yeah, usually taking Monday morning off because <laughs> I went and did something on Sunday night. Right. Uh, in the beginning, we had a lot of listeners say, man, you just made me shift my whole work schedule by a day. I now have Mondays off. Because I had a good time hanging out with yeah. us. So. That's, you know, that's part of the show. Yeah. People, I know. people imbibed with you. It wouldn't be successful if it didn't feel like you were hanging out with your friends when you're listening to the program. And the only way to make it feel like that is to hang out with your friends. So that's what we do. Awesome. Especially in here. Awesome. <laughs> Let's get some more beer. Perfect.